This video is sponsored by Fishing Clash. After decades of improvement, solar and wind are now some of the cleanest and cheapest ways of producing electricity, but there is still a problem. For renewables to really make an impact, we'll need a reliable and cost-effective way to store that energy they produce for access when we want it and where we want it. We've covered tons of energy storage technologies in this channel, from traditional lithium-ion batteries all the way to mechanical energy storage, even a sand battery. But one recent breakthrough by researchers at MIT may finally present a very interesting solution. The technology is called thermophotovoltaics, and at its core, it uses a lot of familiar technology, but in some truly innovative ways. So how does the technology work? How does it stack up with other energy storage technology? And can it truly be the storage medium we've been waiting for? Let's dive in. Right now, more than 90% of the world's electricity comes from heat sources like coal, natural gas, nuclear energy, and concentrated solar energy. For centuries, these technologies have relied on steam turbines. But the truth is the method isn't particularly effective. For one thing, these systems rely on complex machinery that can be difficult to operate and maintain. But the biggest drawback is efficiency. While the highest efficiency turbines operate around 60% efficiency, on average, steam turbines only operate at around 35%. One main reason is that most industry standard turbines can only handle so much heat. Anything at or above 1500 degrees Celsius and the machines start to break down. This means that a lot of the heat energy ends up simply going to waste. This is why so many researchers have been looking into solid state alternatives. Heat engines with no moving parts that could work efficiently and effectively even at higher temperatures. Enter thermophotovoltaics. Thermo, photo, what now? <laughs> I know it's a mouthful. Thankfully, the shorthand is TPV. So what are TPVs? TPV cells have a lot in common with traditional solar cells. But instead of converting solar radiation into electricity, these cells absorb radiation from a heat source in the form of thermal radiation. See? Thermo, photo, Voltaics. We'll dive into the specifics in just a little bit, but stick with us. This particular breakthrough comes from MIT researchers led by Esegun Henry, Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering in partnership with the National Renewable Energy Lab. Really, it's two breakthroughs. The first is a revolutionary way of storing renewable energy. It starts by feeding surplus wind or solar energy into a semiconducting material like tin heating it to incredibly high temperatures, we're talking well over 2,000 degrees Celsius or 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, the tin melts. The molten tin then gets pumped through a closed-loop system of carbon composite pipes. Those pipes lead to a sealed, insulated building filled with massive blocks of graphite. The whole room is filled with argon gas, which helps keep the room inert or chemically inactive, which helps prevent the carbon and tin from oxidizing, as would be the case if you had air, which has oxygen. Once the heat transfers into the graphite, it can stay there for a long time. Why graphite? Well, if you remember from our graphene video we did a while back, graphite also is an excellent conductor of heat, thanks to layers of carbon atoms and free electrons. But there's more. According to Professor Henry, the rate at which heat leaks out of the blocks is proportional to their surface area, whereas the amount of energy they can store relates to their volume. So the smaller the object, the larger the surface area as a function of the volume. That's why a hot cup of tea cools down way faster than, let's say, the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Therefore, larger objects have a much smaller surface area to volume ratio. The graphite blocks cover an area about half the size of an American football field. They will literally take months to cool down, making them the perfect medium for storing thermal energy. Speaking of energy, I think it might be time to take a break and tell you about our sponsor this week, Fishing Clash. Running this channel is like two full-time jobs. Between writing and research and managing the team, I can't stress enough the importance of taking a break and letting your mind wander. It's when my best ideas come to me and why I love playing Fishing Clash. Whether you're an avid fisherman or not, Fishing Clash is a beautiful fishing simulator for iOS and Android, enjoyed by millions of anglers around the world. I also love progress and leveling up. And with Fishing Clash, you can unlock new locations around the world, upgrade your rod and lures, and keep leveling up your fishing game. With weekly competitions and events, it's always a good time whether you play by yourself or with others online. My favorite part is you don't have to play for hours. I usually play for 15 to 20 minutes at a time, and you can just pick right back up whenever you want. 
Try doing that with real life fishing. Also, there's a lot less sun exposure. Check out Fishing Clash today and use my gift code FISHWITHRICKY to get a three star rod, one mythical lure, 50 luck power ups, and 30 weight power ups to help you catch bigger fish. A $20 value for free for new players. Huge thanks to Fishing Clash and you for supporting the show. But wait, Ricky, you ask, haven't we covered concentrated solar batteries before? Didn't one utterly fail, costing billions of dollars? Here's what makes this one different. The researchers at MIT have found some innovative ways to fix the shortcomings of other similar storage technology. If you remember from our video about the Crescent Dunes plant in Nevada, one reason the system failed was because the high temperature working fluid kept springing leaks causing massive stalls. The stalls meant lost time and money, which is why it ultimately shut down. One way the MIT researchers resolved this issue was by developing a carbon-based sealing solution which can effectively trap the hot liquid in the closed loop system. In laboratory experiments, the team was able to pump molten tin at temperatures well above 2000 degrees Celsius with no leaks or other issues. Again, in the lab, so grain of salt, but the technology was so groundbreaking that it warranted an entire scientific paper in its own right. And that's not even the main breakthrough. Still, we've seen breakthroughs before that use high temperatures and molten materials. While the team has so far shown the resilience of the materials in the lab, it's still worth noting how many systems have literally crashed and burned. Even the heat tiles on a spacefaring craft are often replaced after a few trips. Because this technology is still in the experimental phase, we can't know for sure how it'd hold up in the real world. Okay, so that's how the system stores energy, but how do we produce electricity? This is where the TPV cell comes in. Whenever the grid demands power, heat from the graphite blocks transfers into a second building, which houses an array of large, hollow, rectangular, carbon-based chambers lined with tungsten foil. Why tungsten? One reason is that tungsten tends to radiate photons across a broad spectrum, from high energy ultraviolet to low energy infrared. Basically, it emits more usable light that the TPV cell can absorb and turn into electricity. Once the heat gets transferred, the tungsten glows white hot like the filament in an incandescent light bulb. The cell sits inside a chamber called the power block. Depending on how much electricity is needed, the cells can be raised up and down inside the power block, increasing or decreasing exposure to the light emitted from the glowing hot tungsten. As we mentioned up top, these cells have a lot in common with the solar cells you have on your roof, but they also have some key differences. One major difference is the materials they're made out of. The solar panels on your roof are made out of silicon and are tuned to have a specific band gap that determines the wavelengths of light that interact with it to knock its electrons out of position and send them into the electrical circuit. All photovoltaic cells, including TPV, are tuned to absorb photons in a narrow range, which often means light with higher and lower frequencies get wasted. Instead of silicon, the MIT team opted for a material called gallium arsenide, the same stuff NASA used on their solar panels in space. Gallium arsenide can absorb relatively more energy from the incident solar radiation because of the relatively higher absorption coefficient. This also means, in this context, it can absorb energy from light emitted from the glowing tungsten instead of the sun. But the TPV cells also have one other key difference. The cells used in your roof are single junction cells, meaning they only have two different semiconducting materials for its PN junction. While single junction cells are generally considered low cost, they also suffer from lower efficiency due to what's known as the Shockley quasar limit, essentially the maximum efficiency of solar cells based on the principle of detailed balance. It places the maximum solar conversion efficiency at around 33.7% for a single junction solar cell. The TPV cells, however, utilize multiple gap junctions in order to jump over this limitation. Henry's team laid down more than two dozen thin layers of different semiconductors to create two separate cells stacked one on top of another. We actually covered multi-gap junction solar cells in our solar panel world record video, which we'll put a link to below. Each layer has a slightly different band gap to absorb a wider range of the light spectrum. The higher band gap captures the highest energy photons from the heat source. In this case, the top junction can capture light in the visible part of the spectrum with wavelengths around 800 nanometers. The bottom junction is modified to capture infrared light. Together, they can capture a much wider spectrum of light than typical solar cells. So how do these cells endure such intense heat? The solution is brilliant. The cells are mounted onto four sides of a heat sink, a block of metal with water channels flowing through it. The water draws heat away from the cells, but the key is that it moves quickly enough that it stays in liquid form and doesn't itself turn into steam. 
but it doesn't stop there. While these cells can absorb a wider array of light compared to their silicon siblings, there's still a large amount of light that escapes. But the team doesn't want that precious energy to just go to waste. So right at the base of the cell, the team placed a highly reflective mirror. The mirror bounces any remaining light that managed to escape the multi-junction gauntlet back through the cell and into the tungsten material where it's reabsorbed to help keep the tungsten as hot as possible. This not only helps avoid wasted energy, but also maximizes the extraction of the tungsten's luminescence, which in turn boosts the voltage. This has enabled the creation of record-breaking solar cells. That means the quality of a mirrored surface plays a massive part of the efficiency of the cell. The mirrors currently used by the team reached a maximum reflectivity of about 93%. With these numbers, the group says that their TPV cells converted about 41.1% of the energy from the 2400 degree Celsius tungsten filament into electricity. A sizable lead over today's highest rated silicon single junction cells. But it gets even better. Professor Henry explained that his team already has a well-defined pathway to reaching 98% reflectivity to squeeze out an extra 10% overall efficiency in the cell, reaching an overall efficiency of 50%. How much power would that make? Well, if these cells could reach that 50% efficiency mark, a one square meter cell could generate around 100 kilowatts. So an array of 30 by 33 modules, about 990 square meters, will have a total capacity of around 99,000 kilowatts, or close to 100 megawatts. The graphite blocks can hold enough heat to keep the cells generating power for roughly 10 hours, 100 megawatts per hour, for 10 hours means the site could produce a thousand megawatt hours or one gigawatt hour and have to power tens of thousands of homes and compared to traditional steam powered turbines which again suffer from having complex moving parts tpv cells can deliver energy instantly the same way traditional solar cells would this makes them more ideal for grid scale applications now it's worth pointing out that while 50 percent efficiency is nearly double the efficiency of the average silicon panel today which tops out around 22 percent and more than 35 percent achieved by the average turbine it still falls quite short of some other storage systems, specifically lithium ion batteries. The reason lithium ion has been the front runner in the energy storage race for so long is because it's incredibly efficient, converting about 90% of energy back into electricity. But some of the key reasons we have yet to see lithium ion batteries really find their way into grid storage in large volume is expensive raw materials like lithium and nickel, complex expensive supply chains, and ultimately cost. According to the EIA, average battery energy storage capital costs in 2019 were $589 per kilowatt hour, with lithium ion hovering around $300 per kilowatt hour. At the time of this video, Professor Henry recently launched a venture, Thermal Battery Corp to bring this technology to the commercial market. After considerable research, Henry and his team estimate this system could store energy at a fraction of the cost, around $10 per kilowatt hour of capacity. Remember, the gallium arsenide solar panels are way more expensive than silicon panels that we use for our homes. That's why we continue to use silicon and not gallium arsenide. But with such an intense light source as the tungsten in this system, these cells are producing so much electricity that the economics totally shift and this becomes quite cost effective. Remember that the sun is 93 million miles away from us and the strength of light falls off by a square of the distance. So if the sun were half the distance from us, the intensity of the sun's light would be four times higher. This is the key to the superheated tungsten that is placed very close to the TPV panels. And the best part is, installation could be incredibly simple. The team imagines rolling out their TPV storage systems by retrofitting decommissioned gas peaker power plants. One final benefit of the system is that each component operates independently of the others, meaning the system is modular and easily adaptable to the needs of a given grid. Need more storage? Simply add new graphite blocks. Need more power? just add more TPV solar cells. As of right now, Thermal Battery Corp plans to roll out a one megawatt hour pilot system by the end of 2022, which plans to eventually implement a 50 megawatt hour commercial scale system by 2026. All these numbers are based on current technology. We've talked about the potential applications of graphene instead of graphite. Perhaps this could be an excellent application. And as we mentioned, we did another video not long ago about the record-breaking multi-junction solar cells. Who knows, maybe a storage system like this 
could be the perfect home. Now, all of this sounds really promising, but there are still a lot of challenges that Thermal Battery Corp need to solve and prove they can manage. Moving heat around from graphite blocks through molten tin to separate chambers to heat tungsten is all super complex and requires very advanced complex pumps and systems to cope with all that heat. How reliable will such a system prove to be? How much downtime would there be for maintenance? Plus, blasting gallium arsenide PV cells with such intense heat and light is another new challenge engineers haven't faced before. Even with sufficient cooling to keep the panels from overheating, how long would such a cell last? These are all the incredibly challenging questions that are yet to be determined. I think the potential for such a system is pretty incredible, especially because the thermophotovoltaic energy generation concept can be coupled with all sorts of heat storage sources like the Finnish sand battery we just talked about in this video. It's almost better to think of these systems as building blocks that can be combined in different ways. Based on the region and natural resources, heat can be stored in graphite or sand or some other interesting medium. And the thermophotovoltaic system could be the missing ingredient to convert that stored energy back into electricity for the grid. Remember also that there are a ton of industrial applications that produce excess heat that is currently just wasted. Could we start to see TPV systems co-located at power plants or smelters to improve efficiency and absorb some of that lost heat? The opportunities abound. But before we get ahead of ourselves, we need to see how this pilot plant performs first. So that is a look at thermophotovoltaics. It's a fascinating look. When I first read that line about the 100 kilowatts of production, I thought it was a typo, but that's incredible. And it's because that tungsten is putting out so much light when it's heated to that temperature, so close to the cell. It's really remarkable stuff. Yes, there's a ton of challenges. Will the system last? Molten tin. I think you guys know there's a ton of challenges, but I really hope to see this technology work and I wish them success on their pilot plant. But what do you guys think? Are you excited about TPV tech? Think it's going to be a big deal or is it just something that feels pie in the sky? Sound off in the comments below. All right, that will do it for us here this week. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Ricky. This is Tuba Da Vinci. We'll catch you next week.